Hello everyone, uh, this is Nikos Vardakas. Uh, we are broadcasting live from Scuba Life Dice Center. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I'm sure given the, the special edition of the, of the conversation, of the presentation today in English, um, I would like to, um, to commend a couple of things for that. Um, this is uh, a broadcast uh, we've, we have started uh, during the lockdown two and a half months ago. And uh, it takes place every Saturday at uh, 9 p.m. Um, so, uh, uh, obviously in English, in, uh, in Greek. And today we have this special edition because of the wreck we are we're about to present. Uh, with me today we have... a. a uh, our guests and beautiful friends, and I'm starting with a with a new member that we never had him before on our live show, Derek Ramos. Hello, Derek. Hi there. Hi from Germany. Uh, how are you, my friend? Thanks for joining I, us. I'm really well, really well. And thank you all for taking the burden to listen to us in English, and thank you all guys to switch to language which I understand better than the Greek language. I'm familiar with some words in Greek, but I was told not to use them here today. Yes, yes. <laughs> Actually, you were told not to use Greek, neither German tonight, and we stick to English, so we can actually broaden the, the audience tonight. Thank you for that. Thank you for behaving tonight. I will, I will do my very best. Thank you very much for having me here. <laughs> Our second guest is George Mandoros, very good friend and technical diving instructor. Hi, George. Hello, everybody. Really nice to be with you again. Really nice to, to, to see and talk with Dirk again. Uh, and uh, let's try to make it uh, a nice one. I think you've been uh, you've been appearing to this uh, to this uh, broadcast for the last three or four uh, presentations. So for the second season, I'm thinking of uh, replacing Galon with you. So you that better works. you better do a lot of uh, research and and, uh, and uh, study, man. Well, oh. for replacing Galon with me, we need to, to change some stuff. I mean, expect, except of his knowledge about the historical things, and except of his. Uh, abilities as a technical diver. He's also a pretty face, and my face is not that pretty for replacing him. So what are you about... talking about? What are you talking about? I mean, I'm over Guys. sixty. I'm over sixty, and you are talking now strange things. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm pretty Guys. sure. I'm pretty sure we are going to to do it very well. Yeah. Pretty Guys. sure. Okay. Have you been instructed that bulking will take place after the, the live streaming? Oh, well, 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 yes, we do, I, but a small exception is always accepted. Okay. We, have some, we have some commentary already here that the sound is uh, a problem. We got that commentary from Norway, from northern Germany and uh, from Hamburg, uh, which is also northern Germany. So maybe we have some trouble with the sound here. Um, can we just check that? Maybe... Uh, Dimitri, uh, you're using your, um, yeah, Alex, can you just check this if it's something that uh, you can take care of or something that uh, is going on on this member? Obviously, we have a... Uh... Dimitri, close the window. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Give me a second. Absolutely. Um, so... Um, Please let us ask our friends uh, to give us uh, a bit of feedback on the sound after the window has been has been closed. Okay. It's done. It's done. So the third guest for today and always is Dimitri Gallon, friend from Germany, explorer, dive buddy, uh, maritime historian, I would say. Well, wow. hello everybody. Hello everyone. It's very nice to be here with you, especially with my good friend, Dirk Ramos. Uh, it's very good company, my best friends, underwater and overwater. So, let's continue. Uh, so, um, hello again, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. We try to do our best. Uh, excuse any... any um, Accent 
uh, and Indus and I coming from a different uh, four people. None of us are an na English native speaker, so bear with us tonight. Um, yeah, as I said before, uh, this is the actually the it would be the tenth, but it's the ninth presentation. So we have presented nine nine wrecks of the Greek seas so far. And we're aiming to uh, uh, to come back with, a, let's say, season two, uh, not on Netflix, but here, hopefully, we try problem again with the sound. Yes, they say sound is still terrible, Stephanie says. Maybe we need to tune down the sound a little bit, uh, because maybe it's over uh, amplified. Uh, Alex, do you hear me? Can you, can you do something about it? Please. Text me so I can have some feedback. Uh, George, are you on? Uh, uh, do you use uh, earphones? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I can see them. All right. Can uh, 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 Ralph, Ralph, can you feedback who's um, is the echo sound in everyone or only in particular? Uh, uh, here what I got, sorry, uh, I got an information here, a message, so it says there is an echo problem with the sound to broadcast simultaneously. Yes. Is there a chance that any of you is broadcasting from the Facebook and are interfering? Please, guys, uh, tune down uh, the, the volume on any devices you may have there that might create uh, this e echo on a loop. I had a, I had a watch party running. I stopped it now. Let's hope it's getting better now. OK, OK, guys, we are, uh, we're getting some feedback. Uh, it's been a while since we had that uh, problem again with the sound. We tried to fix it before we proceed, so everyone enjoys the conversation tonight. Uh, I got a message. I got a message. Sorry to interrupt you, but I got a message now. Now it's fine. Good. It's now okay. We're okay now. Yes, maybe it was my watch party which I was sharing to my Facebook stream. So I'll just write down there that they should come over to Scuba Live, right? Uh, yeah, Derek, you've been you've been some uh, some trouble for some time now, right? Hey, you know me, eh? You expect me to be. <laughs> trouble, <right? laughs> it wouldn't be anything without it. Exactly. I mean, George, you wouldn't believe I'm there without trouble. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. That's a living <laughs> proof. <laughs> okay, so the uh, yeah, okay. I'm 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 uh, I'm reading now. The the sound has been restored. Uh, thank you guys for your feedback. Uh, so. Um, I was saying we just uh, this is the, the the last presentation of this uh, first season, and we are aiming to to come back with a second season uh, in November uh, uh, with uh, numerous Rex again. And tonight um, we are presenting the Ocean Liner um, uh, SS Budigala. Um, can you the ex former? Um, SS Kaiser Friedrich, right? Is my uh, access co correct, Dimitri? Almost. Almost, okay, I'm trying to, I'm trying to. Um, so, um, I've been, um, I've been uh, posting and I've been writing about this ship like, um, and I, cor and, um, and I um, named it, let's say, as a, as a, the condemned ship. And uh, unlike most, unlike the the blackjack, you don't want to uh, to 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 go over 20, 21, right? Otherwise, you're uh, you're burned. In this case, uh, uh, as uh, you will uh, explain later on in your presentation, um, some constructional constructional uh, problems, let's say somehow condemned this ship uh, uh, to his uh, later fate. And of course, we're gonna talk more about in, in, uh, in, uh, in a bit. Uh, at this point now, I would like to uh, address 
to everyone is listening, uh, not only, of course, uh, here in Greece, but everywhere, uh, that um, uh, a new diving law has been uh, has been uh, released this past May that, uh, with regards to the um, underwater monuments, that's that's the term that used to um, uh, that used to describe these wrecks, let's say, being sunk more than 15 years in Greece. Um, Dimitri Galon, would you like to elaborate on that? Would you like to talk about a bit about the new diving legislation with respect to the, to the, to the wrecks in Greece? Well, uh, we had to live with the law of 2005 uh, and a very strange protection concerning the historical wrecks and protected wrecks in Greece. Now, with the new law from 2020, we are free to dive those wrecks uh, through um, um, a, um, a dive basis or a dive um, organization or whatever. Or, uh, dive center, so I would dive say. Dive center, yeah. We dive center, this, is, this is the correct word, correct. Uh, so, if you, are, if you have the possibility, uh, you have the possibility then to dive those wrecks, uh, uh, using the um, um, using a dive center facilities, in this case you do not, um, in accordance to the law, you do not uh, need any permit uh, to dive those wrecks. So this is a new thing, and um, as I said, in accordance to the law, uh, we are able to dive those wrecks right now without needed um, a special permit from uh, underwater uh, antiquities department only going to a dive center and erase everything there. That's the thing. Yeah, we, we felt the need to announce also here, since we are, we are broadcasting English tonight, as we did um, the past, uh, uh, during the, fair, the after the legislation has been, has been uh, uh, in effect. Uh, so uh, thank you for that, Dimitri. George. Yes. <laughs> So, uh, before we go to the historical um, facts about the reg uh, presented by Dimitri, um, I would like to ask how you have been involved and uh, with this kind of a series of projects, let's say, that have been done um, in the, the past. I think it's now 12 years since first the, the, the reg has been, has been discovered. Yes, it is 12 regs. Uh, 12, uh, 12 years, I'm sorry. Um, Why you are here tonight? <laughs> yeah. Before, before, before I do that, I would like to ask a question to Dimitri to clarify something that I do hear it every, every now and then, all these years. This is about the pronunciation of the name. I would like from Dimitris to inform us all what is the correct, if there is any correct, pronunciation of the name. Is it Burdigala or is it Burdigala or is it whatever it is? Burdigala. <laughs> Burdigala. <laughs> right. Because um, that, that's, that's the question I have. Now, um, concerning your... your why, uh, why are you asking a Greek living in Germany about the pronunciation of a French name? Because right. it's a very clear <laughs> thing, Derek. It's a very clear thing. It's a, it's a French name so in that case, uh, it has to be Burdigala. I'll give you an example. Um, in Greek, uh, in Greece, uh, um, we used you know you have this um, uh, this uh, gasoline places like um, uh, Texaco. We say in Greece Texaco. So um, in Germany they say Texaco, and if you go to France uh, they say Texaco. So in this this is always a possibility to understand where you are. If you hear Texaco, you are in France. If you are Texaco, you are in Germany. And Texaco, you are in Greece, for sure. In this case, Burdigala is Burdigala. So but let's the, give one last name, a. because we're, we're, we're broadcasting internationally, I would say, tonight. So we keep the Burdigala, OK? Burdigala That's is great. the name. And, and that is a, a very um, short example of how you make uh, a two-hour presentation into a four-hour presentation. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, well, uh, I first have to say that uh, concerning your, your question, my, my involvement in the REC was, uh, was with Dimitris and actually was the, the first expedition I did with Dimitris. 
uh, and is uh, it was the first time I we actually met, and um, that's where our story, our common story about uh, diving wrecks and investigating those wrecks, uh, started. Um, it was an, an invitation uh, from Dimitris um, and uh, Nikos that was also part of it would be a part of, of that expedition at uh, that time uh, to to the team that we had um, some friends uh, in in Athens the mixed gas adventures was the the team that we we had to participate in that uh, in that exploration and uh, that's how the whole thing started and uh, I'm really happy that we all accepted this we we did had some really good times over there and we did have some really good times in other places and uh, as you three know we will have really good times up in the future the same places uh, yeah. and other places yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you forgot to mention the, year. the year that year was the year 2010 yes 10 years ago that was now, now, now 2009 have... was the year that we joined all together. Yes. But 2010 was the year that we actually managed to dive the Burdigala. Correct. I think as I, as I look at you right now, the, the very last recollection I have with all these faces was, uh, I think the last time all four together was decoying uh, a boat <laughs> returning. <laughs> six meters stop. That yeah, is the recollection was. I have for all these four faces right now, right? Yes, yeah. <laughs> yes. There, there is one Absolutely. more face missing, Mauricio's face, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah. yes. Well, he, he was kind of like this huge character in the back, being, being the carer for all of us, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Bigger than life. Absolutely, Absolutely. Derek Ramers, thank you for joining, very good friend. Um, uh, we are really uh, pleased to have you tonight here uh, because uh, you've been uh, you've been big part on this uh, on this wreck actually and this uh, uh, explorations that have been have been done throughout these past twelve years let's say. I started up and I have to say thanks to all of you all of you guys here and I started on my first expedition to Bodigala was in two thousand twelve, which was. Um, with Dimitri's boat, we sailed over from Egina, and there was a nice travel. Um, I will not mention the travel back and what happened on that travel. <laughs> <laughs> but on the way... Um, it's, to... Benitos again. it's Benitos again, right? Yes. Yes. Benitos again. Yes, yeah. yes. And uh, then we had this super nice expedition, and I have to say that this expedition triggered a lot in me. It was 2012. We were diving open circuit uh, eight years ago, and George was diving close circuit already. He was on the, if I remember correctly, it was a Copus Mag, correct? The Copus Mag, yeah. Yes. And um, one of my very vivid memories of this trip was that we rented a place for our gas storage and uh, for the mixing, which was a, a farm and it was the slaughtering place, the slaughtering room. So basically every night I was there with my friend Wilhelm and we were filling gases for us four open circuit divers. We were six in total. It was George, George and Oh my Yannis. God. Should I, yeah. should I put the eight designations on the screen before you proceed? No, it's, it's <laughs> going to be, it's going to be even slaughter, for slaughter young people. And stuff, no, yeah. no, we don't, don't talk about slaughter, but it just took us some time to get the gases ready. And every night we're standing there to one, two, three o'clock or whatever time and every evening I received a message from George or Yanis for that matter like hey guys we're sitting here at the swimming pool why don't you join us having a drink because we are already fixed for tomorrow <laughs> so that set us thinking and as most of us now are on rebuilders um, in hindsight um, thank you George you were ways ahead years yeah. ahead <laughs> you're welcome you're welcome but uh... Uh, j jumping back into that, that, that I, I do use this this expedition as an example to every time I want to talk about rebreathers. I'm always talking about an expedition, and I, I'm not using names. I will use from tomorrow. Oh, can, can, please. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm I'm always talking about a group of four people that they were diving a wreck of about uh, 70, 60 meters for 45 minutes to nearly an hour sometimes of bottom time. 
And those uh, open circuit divers, they were staying late, filling the gases. And at the end of the expedition, after four or five dives, I think it was four dives we did there all that time, or six, uh, I, I don't I, remember. I, it was some. Yeah. Um, these divers had to pay about 500 to 700 euros in gas fees, transportation fees for all the logistics, plus the late hours of filling. And the example here is that me and my friend Yanis Protopopas, that we were diving the, the megs, we had with us a twin set of bottom mix. Uh, we, uh, we had a 12 liter cylinder of oxygen and we were decanting with an old hand booster pump. And we paid for all this as a gas expense, 70 to 100 euros each. And yes, we were at eight o'clock in the afternoon, done, finished in the swimming pool. And most of the time we have already had dinner. Yes. You guys, you guys are both CCR instructors for different units, different organizations. So, so you've been, uh, you've been, uh, you know, diving and uh, uh, these machines and know the, the advantages um, and especially uh, get involved in uh, this kind of expeditions like uh, the Britannic or any other, uh, sorry, uh, the Budigala, Budigala or any other expeditions like the Britannic I mentioned er earlier, where uh, me and Dimitri at that time, that was like four years ago, uh, had to dive double 20s and <laughs> four or five stages, uh, you know, together with deco stages, I mean, to dive like 15 minutes on the wreck. Yeah, that so, was a serious. That was a serious issue at that time because we did the with the same um, configuration. We also did. Uh, we also did the dive on uh, on the Britannic. We did the um, yes. um, the dive on the Britannic on uh, OC, and Derek and uh, George did it on uh, on CCR. Yes, yes, exactly. We did. It, I, we did. I don't Go think you had a, I don't think you had a problem with that, but no. George had. George had yes. because he was joining your team. And he had to take care of all these dangling tanks around you. And I remember me swimming around you because you fought the current with all your tanks hanging around empty around you. And George and me, we could swim around because it was so easy with the CCRs sure. just because we were streamlined and you weren't. Um, you couldn't. And so we had some fun on that. Yes. And, but and for those that have died, I think they know that at the very, I mean, at the shallow, that, I mean, within zero to 20 or 30, the, the, there are numerous times that the, the current is ripping. So it's it's a big deal there. Uh, uh, yeah, Derek, go ahead. And on a, on a more serious note, it's uh, in, in reality, it's uh, you can do big dives also in open circuit. Don't get me wrong on this. Uh, it's just a little bit picking here. It's, it's just a matter also of safety in the end. If you have any issues in the water, uh, with the rebreathers, you can adopt very fastly because you're just not you're just not uh, restricted on gas. You're not restricted on time, especially <laughs> the deco. If you need to adjust, you can easily adjust. Open circuit, you're pushing the limits. And so, yeah. in that sense, in in these magnitude of dives, the rebreathers are a safety issue. Yeah. Yes, it is. Very well said, Dirk. Very well said. And uh -huh. uh, just to add one more thing, and then take it further up, it's also the feeling you have when, when, you, you, when you dive those dives with a breather is, I'm going to say, it, it's more friendly. The whole experience of, of going that deep, staying that long and doing lots of hours of decompression with a breather as, as part of your diving system is, is a friendlier way of doing those hardcore dives. And... Um, yeah, make things a lot easier and more, a lot safer. Dimitri. Absolutely. Yeah. Go ahead, Dirk. It absolutely is. I just want to add here for everyone to know that George and me, although we teach for different agencies, we have very much in common that we do also um, have a big stress on the bailout, bailout gases. So uh, we all carry enough gases that in the case the rebreather breaks, we can reach the surface safely. I just want to add this for everyone to know that um, just because my, my first sentence could be understood that we carry less tanks, it's not, it's not correct. We carry it differently, that's the way, and uh, we just don't drain them. That's a big, big difference there. Yes, exactly. Um, 
Dimitri, coming back to the wreck, uh, before my first dive, and I don't know of a diver that have dived this wreck, and uh, he didn't, I mean, he didn't uh, left with, uh, with, with eyes wide open, actually. Because before I dive the, the Budi Gala, uh, as you may know, I've dived, many, uh, I've, I've dived lots of wrecks here in Greece, not of this magnitude, but a uh, couple of them similar to that. But this is a quite different wreck. Can you tell us a few things about it? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. But uh, well, uh, actually, I would like to, I would like to, to, um, to tell things about the, the Budi Gala in my presentation. I, I could mention a few things right now. Well, um, this is a wreck which uh, lies in round about 75 meters depth. So it's accessible. Uh, you may, um, you may uh, do long, um, long dives on the wreck. Uh, you may stay quite long on the wreck. Because you can average actually much less than the average. Meters. The average is around about sixty meters. Mm -hmm. So it's it's uh, for experienced diver. It's easy to spend some like uh, between uh, thirty five minutes to forty five minutes on the wreck, doing uh, doing a cool dive. Um, um, the wreck is not looted. Everything is there. You have everything, outside the wreck, inside the wreck, whatever. Uh, which, is, have, which is which is what makes this wreck one of the one of the nicest uh, uh, wrecks in the area. It stays upright down. I mean, it's, it stays on the on the on the keel. So mm -hmm. uh, you have everything which you may you may visit in the uh, um, in the uh, in the bridge. Sir. You may do some if you have the possibility. You may do some some penetration also in the holes if you have the permit. And except that uh, we have incredible visibility. It's a very big cracker. It's 183 meters long. Um, the, um, the good of, um, uh, of the superstructure is still there. It's not destroyed. You have so many elements you may, you may, you may recognize again. It's, it's incredible. I remember the first time that I dived the wreck, I was buddy up with Dirk, and as soon as we reached down the line of the superstructure, which was like 50, 54, 56 meters, <laughs> I knew that Dirk was, was uh, hearing me at that time screaming inside the wreck, wow, and wow, and wow, so, because I was actually, I was identifying several characteristics of the wreck, like there. And we're gonna talk about this in a bit. You remember was, that, Greg, right? It was such an amazing moment. Also, I mean, every time going down to that wreck, this is a wreck, as Dimitri just stated. It's in such a beautiful condition, beautiful positioning, navigational positioning, just there, as if it wants to just drive on, just exactly. carry on. Exactly. And I was so. I was so afraid that you're going to lose your regulator and your gas supply because you were so <laughs> overwhelmed by everything. <laughs> I was, I was. Uh, Dimitri, is this, uh, so the, we, we mentioned something that this is the second largest wreck being sunk in the Greek Yes. Waters. Yes. The first one is uh, HMS Britannic, and the second one is the SS, uh, the Ocean Liner Budigala. And it happens that these two ships, they sunk one week apart, few miles away to each other. Yes. Yes. Correct. Uh, can you? Can we go and uh, talk about some uh, some his uh, about history of the wreck? Sure, I would like. And I would have like a chance to to go through questions and a lot of sure, comments. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, um, my my presentation is going to last something between twenty and twenty five minutes, and um, I'm going to show. Uh, sorry for that, but there's you know, Derek. To, 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 to tell everyone, to tell everyone, to tell everyone, to tell everyone, it's Dimitri minutes. Yes, Dimitri they minutes. Double for the rest of the world. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Time but I have to mention one more time that we do not have only divers. Uh, 
um, being uh, present right now. We have people which they are also very interested in in, in the history of the record. And uh, this is what as I'm going to do. Are. And yes. of are as well. <laughs> and this is what I'm going to do right now, Dirk. Exactly. They're, they're long time supporters. They've been supporting our broadcast since the, okay. the first okay. month. Okay, good. Are you ready, guys? Yes, yes, yes. I Go start. ahead. So, do you see the ship? Yes. That's Sorry. great. So, as the most um, of you perhaps know, um, the luxury ocean liner SS Budigala, formerly known as Schnelldampfer Kaiser Friedrich, is one of the most important shipwrecks of the Greek seas. The vessel which struck a mine and sunk at the northwest of the island of Kea on the 14th of November 1916 became very popular in the recent years due to her intertwined story with the other famous wreck of the Greek seas, the, uh, namely the um, hospital ship HMHS Britannic. The SS Budigala is the second largest preserved um, shipwreck in uh, modern history that has been discovered in the Greek archipelago after the HMHS Britannic, which is the largest. Uh, just as human history is dominated by powerful figures, so is the history of uh, maritime shipping market by large and uh, powerful ships, some of which became central in the development and prosperity of shipping industry itself. The history of these vessels is, is intertwined not only with the companies that showcase them, but also with significant events that make up human history. The French ocean liner SS Boutigala, or SS Kaiser Friedrich, as it was first uh, christened, claims a position in the history of North Atlantic steam navigation, unlike any other ship associated with the development of shipping. Unlike other ships, SS Boutigala was well known for her failures rather than her successes. This vessel was constructed for one of the most important shipping companies of Imperial Germany, the Norddeutsche Lloyd, or better known as NDL, with the intent to compete for the price of speed and luxury in the most highly demanding shipping route of the time, the North Atlantic route. She failed to fulfill the expectations of um, her owner, who had uh, contractually specified that the ship's minimum speed be 22 knots, a number that the vessel never achieved. This failure taken in here through, the, through her 17 years of existence, she served for less than five years and was condemned to remain mothballed in storage, dry dock, and port for the remainder of your time. Born as the German Schnelldampf and Kaiser Friedrich, here we see two posters of the famous Norddeutsche Lloyd or NDL. At the end of 1895, the Norddeutsche Lloyd, under the administration of manager Dr. Heinrich Wiegen, set up the ambitious goal of taking over the Europe to North America shipping route, then dominated by the British, mainly by Cunard Line. To accomplish this, the company needed ships capable not only of crossing the Atlantic faster than the ships of companies like Habak of Hamburg or the French Line, but also faster than the renowned ships of the British not light, of course. Uh, Dimitri, just to yes. interrupt you for a second, we are talking about uh, the, the very end of the 19th century. Correct. And, and that was the first, let's say, wave of immigrants traveling from Europe, let's say, to the United States. No, that was not the from first. America. That was not the first. The immigrants started traveling to the, um, to the New World in 18th century already. Okay. Okay. But uh, that, was the time, that was the time of the steamers. Um, traveling and sailing uh, the North Atlantic, uh, the most uh, the most important line at that time. Uh, I'm talking um, that happened in the in the last quarter of the um, of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. So um, for this purpose, just to beat the British the British lines, 
Dr. Vegan of NDL ordered two ocean liners for two ship, uh, from two shipyards. The AG um, Age Vulcan shipyard of Stettin. Today, uh, Stettin is, uh, belongs to, to Poland. Constructed the ocean liner Kaiser Wilhelm der Grosse, while the Ferdinand Sichau of Danzig, which also belongs to Poland today, built the ocean liner Kaiser Friedrich. In accordance with the Norddeutsch Lloyd policy, vessels names honored the Kaisers of the Hohenzollern family, from which Kaiser Wilhelm II uh, and his ancestors uh, descended. Kaiser Wilhelm II was the last Kaiser of the Imperial Germany. Um, the contract between the Sichau shipyard and the Norddeutsch Lloyd stipulated that the test speed of the Kaiser Friedrich be 22.5 knots for a period of six hours, and that uh, the quarantine speed be at least 21 knots, so that the total duration of a transatlantic voyage was exactly six days. Predicated on these requirements, she was designed with the following characteristics. Length, 183 meters, width, 19.4 meters, turnouts 12,480 12, GOT, GOT stands for gross register tonnage, and the deplacement of the vessel was 20,100 tons. The two five-cylinder reciprocating engines of quadruple expansion drove two three-wing brass propellers of 6.19 6 meters in diameter. The engines were supposed to have a maximum indicative power of 28,000 horsepower, and in combination with the 15.5 bar pressure of the 10 boilers of the ship, they could offer an important savings on coal, according to the estimations of the Sikhauer engineers. Unlike the common construction practices of that period, Ferdinand Sikhau placed the ship engines a little more forward between the second and the third boilers. The ship had nine main boilers. It's fitted with two coal loading trap doors plus a tenth auxiliary boiler. These were positioned in three watertight compartments, each with a funnel. Uh, Dirk Remus, a specialist um, on, uh, on this, uh, on this uh, uh, theme, uh, um, he, uh, we have, um, he did a very, he had a great um, presentation uh, in 2016 on the island of Kea concerning the uh, five-cylinder reciprocating, reciprocating um, engines of quadruple expansion of, uh, of Kaiser Friedrich. And I guess that he uh, he's going to, to inform us with some more details. Talk, yeah, he's going to talk about this uh, after after your historical, let's say, background. That's great, that's great. I it, thank you very much. Because we, we basically, just to say something more, because this is one of the of the things that placed, let's say, the construction details, they placed this ship in 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 her fate, basically. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes very much so. Well. After construction concluded in uh, May 1898, uh, the vessel undertook her first voyage uh, on the 12th of May from Danzig to Bremerhaven, the mother port of uh, Norddeutsche Lloyd. During that voyage, the engineers of um, Norddeutsche Lloyd observed with great disappointment that Kaiser Friedrich was only able of reaching 20 knots with huge effort and could not surpass that speed. Great issue. Uh, on her arrival in Bremerhaven, Norddeutsche Nord Lloyd refused to accept delivery based on the explicit conditions of the contract and her poor performance. The Friedrich Sichau shipyard promised it would improve her speed, and so NDL, the Norddeutsche Lloyd, tenta uh, tentatively accepted Kaiser Friedrich into its fleet. Her first transatlantic voyage was to be from Bremerhaven to Southampton and then to New York. On the 7th of June 1898, Kaiser Friedrich sailed under the command of NTL Captain Ludwig Stormer from Bremen to Southampton. On the 8th of June, she began her first transatlantic voyage towards New York. The voyage started well but quickly. Bad weather and engineering problems 
decrease the speed of the ship. Later, the operation of the left engine uh, halted, um, halted for 20 hours and 26 minutes. And then the same happened with the right engine for 11 hours and 42 minutes. The result was disastrous as the voyage of Kaiser Friedrich from Southampton to Sandy Hook, New York, lasted seven days, 10 hours and 15 minutes, finally ending on the 16th of June, 1898. On the 20, 25th of June, 1898, uh, Kaiser Friedrich began her return voyage to Southampton without passengers. This lasted nine days, two hours, and uh, 30 minutes. Due to her low average speed of 15 knots and the mechanical problems that again plagued the, uh, the voyage, NDL canceled the next um, two scheduled, scheduled voyages. The ship was sent to the Friedrich Seekau shipyard in Danzig to be fixed with the intent to reach the promised 22 knots. Over the coming months, Kaiser Friedrich fulfilled nine more voyages of which the fastest Fastest was six days, 22 hours, and 30 minutes, placing the ship firmly in the class of 19 nodes. On the 27th of June, 1899, Norddeutsche Lloyd returned Kaiser Friedrich to her construction company with the official reason that the ship did not fulfill the speed requirement of the contract. In 1898, the shipping company, Hamburg Amerikanische Paket, uh, Paketfahrt Aktiengesellschaft, uh, we said, okay, well, that we are not, uh, we are not going to uh, to talk in German today, but I may not avoid it. Hamburg Amerikanische Paketfahrt Aktiengesellschaft, better known as Habak. Uh, today, Habak, uh, Habak Lloyd um, sold one of its ocean-going ships to the Spanish government. They then decided to charter Kaiser Friedrich from Friedrich Sichau and added here to its express line from Hamburg to Southampton and New York. On 2nd October 1899, Kaiser Friedrich departed from Southampton to New York for her first transatlantic voyage with Habak. Over the next few months, the ship completed nine transatlantic voyages. According to the press of that period, Kaiser Friedrich looked like um, she had finally found a home in the Habak fleet. Her speed was comparable to that uh, of other ocean-going vessels while offering a more luxurious and sophisticated accommodations than the others. In July 1900, Habak received the newly constructed ocean liner, the SS Deutschland, and within only a few months, she conquered the speed trophy, the so-called Blue Ribbon. Uh, this accomplishment signaled the entry of Habak into the superior class of transatlantic shipping and the end of chartering the Kaiser Friedrich. In October of 1900, Kaiser Friedrich began her last transatlantic voyage from New York. Upon her arrival in Hamburg, she was returned to Friedrich Sichau, who laid her up in Hamburg, where she stayed for almost 12 years. So basically, it was very important for the shipping companies at that time to, to, to get the, the Blue Ribbon because yes. they get the credibility, let's say, sure. uh, um, of their services they, they were providing, right? Yes. Uh, the Blue Ribbon is, was just a simple uh, ribbon with the, um, the, um, the vessel uh, carried on the main, uh, on the main mast, on the, on the forecast. And uh, Blue Ribbon uh, mean, uh, was given to the speedest, to the speedest um, steamer of the world. Um, actually, the speedest steamer of um, uh, the North Atlantic line. Uh, but uh, that was the place. I mean, being the, uh, the fastest uh, steamer of uh, North Atlantic line, that, was, uh, that means that uh, the steamer was the, the speedest, the fastest steamer uh, of the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, the Kaiser Friedrich uh, remained inactive in Hamburg until the 1st of May 1912, when she was bought for 4 million French francs by the Compagnie de Navigation Sud Atlantique, based in Bordeaux, France. The ship was renamed Bourdigala in accordance with Sud Atlantique's policy to award ancient Latin names to its ships, such as uh, Lutetia for Paris, 
Gallia for France and Burdigala for Bordeaux. Burdigala is the ancient Latin name of the city of Bordeaux. According to Sibian historian Arnold Kludas, a um, German historian, Burdigala was renovated at the Blom and Four shipyard in Hamburg, which is not far away from my place where I live. In addition to modifying its foot uh, holes, changes were also made to the ship's main systems, including the boilers. Finally, the ship was painted white and displayed the coat of arms of Sud Atlantique on its funnels, a red rooster, the symbol of the ancient Gauls. Following the completion of the renovations, Portugala sailed from Hamburg to Bordeaux, where she was enthousi enthusiastically welcomed as the biggest and fastest, si fastest ship of the South Atlantic. On the 5th of October 1912, the Burdigala undertook her first voyages to Buenos Aires, Argentina. The voyage was uh, uneventful, but on her return, the ship experienced engineering problems that led her to the shipyard for repairs immediately upon her arrival at Bordeaux. During her time of inactivity, Company Sud Atlantic replaced her with a chartered vessel. Uh, this fact, along with Prudigala's huge consumption of coal, made Sud Atlantic re-examine the ship's value. They determined, they determined that she was uh, ultimately not um, profitable or profitable enough and retired here on 1st November 1913, when Sud Atlantic's new liner, the SS Lutetia, began her first voyage to South America. On the 19th of November 1913, Burdigala was condemned and she stayed at the port of Bordeaux until the beginning of World War I and her requisitioning by the French government. The requisitioning of the Burdigala marks the beginning of the last chapter in the ship's existence. The French government used the Burdigala both as a troop ship and supply carrier from the Mediterranean French city of Toulon to other theaters of war. In 1915 and 1916, and until her sinking, the Burdigala carried troops to the Dardanelles and to Thessaloniki in Greece, which served as the base of the Antan forces in the Balkans. Here we see a photo of the Burdigala. We may see the um, um, routers on the funnels, and uh, the Burdigala is in the, um, in the port of Toulon in France, in south of France. On 13th November 1916, the Burdigala sailed empty from Thessaloniki to Toulon to load troops and supplies. Her captain was the, the reservist Lieutenant Francois Roland, and the engineer Auguste Richard served as chief engineer on the vessel. The next day, at 10.45 uh, at a medium, almost two nautical miles southwest of the Cape of Agios Nicolaos in Kea Island, an explosion uh, at a midship uh, on the starboard side uh, caused the ancient room to float. At first, given that the ship had only a list of four degrees, her captain thought that uh, thought the vessel um, would not sink. But 20 minutes later, however, water began to pour into the vessel's second engine room. As a result, the list of the Bordigala increased and her captain commanded the crew to abandon the ship. A second explosion then ripped the ship in half and 15 minutes later, she sank to a depth of 76 meters of the northwest coast of Kea. The ship had struck a mine laid by the Imperial German submarine U-73 on the 28th of October, 1916. On the photo here, we see the Imperial German submarine U-73 in the nautical base of uh, Cataro, in the, uh, uh, in, the, in the base of the Imperial um, uh, German uh, Navy in, uh, in Montenegro in uh, 1918. Commander of the German submarine was the highly decorated Captain Lieutenant Gustav Sis from Hamburg. We see Gustav Sis here at, at the right, um, and he's decorated with the highest order of the Imperial Germany, the Order pour le Merit. 
him. I do, uh, can you see it? Yes, yes. we can. Um, on the left side, on the photo on the left side, we see um, uh, Captain Leutnant. Captain Leutnant is normally is Lieutenant Commander in English. Uh, Captain Leutnant Gustav Fies. And at the right, uh, we see the, um, um, the ace of the aces, the most successful submarine commander ever. He is the Captain Leutnant, the commander, the um, uh, Lieutenant Commander Lothar von Arno de la Perrier, uh, commander of the legendary U-35. Um, just one week later, on the 21st of November, only two nautical miles from Budigala, the British hospital ship HMHS Britannic was also sunk after striking a mine in the same minefield. Here we see the minefield, which was uh, deployed on the 28th of October 1916. Here we see the Bay of Kea. Here is the Cape of Agios Nikolaos. And this is the northwest side of the island of Kea. In, um, I would like now to mention a few things concerning the discovery and the exploration of the um, that time um, unknown uh, wreck. In 2007, uh, the assistant professor um, George Papathéodoulou of the Department of Geology at the University of Patras, Greece, led his team in the mapping of uh, the bottom of the region north of Kia Island using site scan sonar. During the survey, a large unidentified shipwreck was spotted. The Kia Dive Project, that was the name for the first expedition, was thus uh, organized to examine and document the wreck from the 21st to the 30th of September 2008. The Kia Dive project was the first project was carried out having a aim to examine and document the then unknown wreck. I would like to mention the names of the people which joined the, joined the Kia Dive project at that time. That was Vasilis Mavros, um, uh, Nikos Karajas, Areti Kominou, George Karelas, uh, and Yanis Rosunelos Rusun and myself. During this um, mission, which was accompanied by a supervisor from the Hellenic Ephorate uh, of Underwater Antiquities, the wreck was examined, documented, and finally identified to be the ocean line of Budikala, formerly the Kaiser Friedrich. Since then, five more expeditions have been carried out to collect more information, to answer questions, and to highlight the wreck and its history. The Budikala sits upright on her keel, as we see here in this draft of a side scan made by side scan sonar of the University of Patras. Um, the wreck is uh, cut in two sections and is at a depth um, of 76 meters with the bow and aft masts broken. We see them here. Can you see my mouse? We yes. can, yes, we can spot it. Um, and fallen to the starboard side. Just going slowly. The longitudinal uh, axis of the vessel from stern to bow points southeast. The two sections, the first and the second, tilt to the right. The fore section lists by about 10 degrees and the after by approximately 25 degrees. The overall, overall length of the wreck, including the, um, the halt gap, which we see here, is approximately 200 meters. The depth ranges from 76, which is here at the propellers, up to 54 meters, where one finds the upper sections of the ship superstructure here bridge, actually. Along the foredeck, which is also part of the upper uh, forecastle, think anchor chains on it uh, extend from the bow holes uh, to the large two-inch winches, which still hold the two massive anchors in the raised position. 
we just um, see the anchor, the starboard anchor here. On either side uh, of the fore deck, uh, along the vertical axis, uh, two large caliber cannons uh, face the sea. At the end of the bow deck, uh, there is a deepening which interrupts the smooth, uh, form, um, uh, the smooth form of the main deck, a structure, structurally separating the bow section from the main superstructure. See, here uh, we see on, uh, on, on, uh, on this photo, made by Dirk Remmers, uh, the mechanism uh, of the, uh, this is the, uh, the port side uh, um, cannon uh, with uh, the wheels and all the mechanism to, uh, um, to move it. Uh, in this area, and at about 10 meters long, is the foremast broken and its base, um, but with the internal rearing intact, uh, and sure, still until today, and this is this is very fine. This is very nice. Uh, every time we, we we dive the wreck, we 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 see the bell on uh, the fork um, on the foremast. Great feeling. In this area, there are also two internal staircases here and there, leading to the upper deck, which is uh, in the second row of the superstructure here, and steerage. The upper deck area included the most luxurious cabins and passenger lounges, such as the music room, smokers, and reading lounges, uh, of which some have collapsed. Here on the photo, we see the bridge with the characteristic seven windows of the bridge of the Boudigala. We see the second row of the superstructure uh, here, the second row of the superstructure and the first row of the superstructure. From the second row of the superstructure, most of the accommodation areas are um, also partially collapsed, except uh, for the wheelhouse bridge and the saloon directly beneath it. The port and starboard side navigation lights are in good condition. Here are the lights. Um, after a century underwater, and this greatly assisted during the identification process of the team uh, compared the wreck with all photographs. Near where the three funnels should be are the remains of large airways uh, arranged in groups of four. The hull breakers separating the wreck into two distinct uh, pieces is almost amidships, uh, right after the ninth lifeboat David come from, um, actually come from, uh, from both of the stern. And at the two vertical sides of the hull brackets, uh, cabins with their various accessories for everyday use, such as uh, sinks and um, bathtubs, uh, as well as uh, pieces of machinery like rollers and shafts uh, are visible. The aft hull section consists of holds uh, number three and four, the engine room, the rest of the superstructure, the aft deck area, the rod room, and the quarter deck. After the third funeral opening, uh, two staircases leading to the deck of the aft peak region are the first things encountered, followed by the broken and fallen aft mast, which we saw before, um, and the mouths of the hull. Well, just uh, Aft of the poop deck are two cannons, which we one of them we see here. This is the port side cannon of the same caliber as those of the, uh, at the bow, uh, also facing towards the sea. The entire area of the stern here, um, of the stern deck, is scattered with cannon cells and ammunition boxes. Um, Nikos, if um, I am not mistaken, this is you. This is this is a photo from. Uh, 2016, correct? Yes, I think it was the was on the dive we spotted the letters of Budi on the very correct, staircase. Correct, 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 correct. Well, lying at a depth of uh, 76 meters, the two large three-bladed propellers are clearly visible at the underside of the ship. Here we see one one under Nikos. We may see uh, one blade of the um, starboard propeller. 
Uh, one blade is missing from the, um, from the port side prop, while the support side prop is immersed in the sand uh, and fully covered uh, by the listing uh, hull. A distinct um, uh, long U-shaped, uh, we see it here, U-shaped structural hull uh, ending at the stern is visible on this photo, as well as um, is also clearly, uh, clearly seen in all the old photos of uh, Budigala. Well, the Budigala may have failed to fulfill the primary goal of steaming at a speed of 22 knots, but she, rem she remained an important marker in shipping history precisely because of this failure. On one hand, the ship's history tells of the activities of the mer merchant shipping business of, uh, of the day, including the know-how, the merchants, the profits, the social structures, and the politics uh, tied to the rise of an industrialized economy. On the other hand, uh, through her voyages and long list of passenger names, uh, the ship represents uh, a chapter in the transatlantic immigration story of the North and South American continents. Her tragic end uh, is directly connected to the social and political crisis of the beginning of the 20th century, expressed uh, through the armed attack uh, that led to the World War I. Furthermore, the Budigala's common historical destiny with the hospital steep sim HMHS Britannic makes her one of the last witnesses to the end of the historical ocean liners lost in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea during World War I. I thank you very much for your attention. And um, Nikos Vardakas, It's your turn. Was that 20? I thought it was quicker. Oh! He, he, he did a really good job, I think. Derek? Oh, that's great. Have you been timing it, him? No, I, well, I mean, I, I would like to hear a comment from, um, from, 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 uh, from Derek Ramos. Actually, Dimitri, you did very well, but you know you were kind of forced, right? Because otherwise some strange things would happen. <laughs> <laughs> But not only this, because we're going to be, uh, we're going to uh, talking and recap a few things about uh, what Dimitris has, has just said. Uh, so basically, there we have uh, ocean liner that was ordered to do these transatlantic trips. She failed uh, constructively, um, uh, construction-wise, to fulfill that speed, that uh, uh, she was ordered to, let's say. And from that point onwards, she started feeling uh, and doing different, different things uh, and deteriorating, let's say, and take her own fate uh, uh, until the very last moment she, she was sunk uh, just around the corner here. Um, we named this ship a condemned ship because she was, let's say, predetermined to this fate. And we mentioned earlier about the construction, uh, uh, the construction um, problem, let's say, she had. Can you, as a, your second, let's say, or um, uh, profession, whatever, uh, as an engineer, can you elaborate what was the problem that led the ship uh, to, to stay? Time out. Sorry to interrupt you, but I think that that Mr. Remmers, just to continue, he needs uh, a chilled beer. Is it correct? Uh, yes, I do. I do. Um, so let me just give a bit of a sense. Maybe I have a chance to get a chilled beer in this very instant here. Before I share the screen, maybe I can get a shield beer before I share it in the screen. And um, maybe there's any chance here. So what is special about the Bodhigala? It's um, the construction of the engine. And the, the, the idea of constructing a ship that fast for that time was very ambitious. And uh, so basically the shipyard constructing that ship 
was really, really keen to prove something. And that was basically, as you say, a predetermination. And see what happens here. I receive a fresh beer. Isn't that fantastic? A fresh, chill beer. Life's good sometimes. You, Let me just open it for a second. How, that, yes. how does this beer come up? Well, some magic things happen, Nico. Some you magic guys, you guys happen. are in different rooms? We are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we are. It's a long way around the corner here. But uh, no, actually, I'm sitting in Dimitri's living room, whereas he is in his working room. So I'm visiting him in Hamburg. And fantastically enough, as Dimitri mentioned already, so the, the whole guard... thing has been, has been staged, right? Absolutely. You didn't get it, right? <laughs> there we are. Even more fantastic than this beer is that from basically the window I'm looking out here, you can't see, but it's behind the, the, the computer. Basically, I could see if there wouldn't be any houses, the shipyard of Blomont Foss, which Dimitri Correct. mentioned. And not only that, at Dimitri's house, and I used to live around the corner, just one street length, one block away, um, when the still belonging to a very famous English shipping company belonging Queen Mary II is docked in Hamburg. Every time at 12 o'clock, the horn blows. So we can hear it here in Dimitri's um, apartment, and I could hear it in my apartment. Remember, Dimitri? Sure, sure. That's true. So let me try to share the screen now. Maybe it works. And uh, should be okay. Uh, yes. I need to go to Skype. Yes. Okay. Uh, fuck. Um, I need to... Uh, uh, wow, that's interesting. What's it, going on? I need to... Um, I need to be the administrator to be able to share the screen. Should be working I now. I don't think so. Oh, okay. Should be working now. Let's try. Yes, there we go. Can you see that uh, slide on the screen now? Should not be, yet. Not, not yet. yet. Should be visible? It's not. That's uh, a pity. Could you share your monitor? Uh, yes, but I can't in Skype, obviously. Ah, yes, I can. Can you see now? Should yeah, be... well, yeah, that's yes, little. that's it. This is what Dimitri's been doing. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. Now you see this... Um, Unique propulsion system slide, right? Everything yes. is fine. Everything we perfect, see, it, perfect. Everything is so, fine. I'm I'm just referring a little bit now to a propulsion system of Bodhigala, and Dimit, I'm I'm shortening this presentation very much here because Dimitri mentioned such a lot of things already. Schichau Werft, which is uh, located in today's Poland, was very well known for steam engines. They were actually one of the first companies building steam engines, uh, which led them also to build locomotives for railroad uh, uh, stories and things. And they were also very well known, and to the day today, for torpedo boats, starting in 1877, constructing of torpedo boats. Actually, all of the torpedo boats in the First World War and Second World War by the German navies um, with the distinguished sign of S, where this S stands for Schichau Werft, so very well known. And after that only, they started with passenger ships. And bearing this in mind, they constructed the Kaiser Friedrich, a big ship, huge one, with, um, as Dimitri already mentioned, a dead weight of more than 20,000 tons. And they constructed it as a five-cylinder quadruple expansion reciprocating steam engine which is kind of a crazy approach because standard is a three-cylinder, three triple expansion steam engine. So in this way, they did a very, very complicated thing. Um, to define a little bit steam engines in, in general, is steam engine is a heat engine that converts heat into mechanical work. And this basically was the first device to do so for mankind. It was before the motor as we know it, the diesel motor or something. So it was a really, really big starter for the industrialization of uh, basically the world. The heat is supplied externally to a closed loop, which usually uses water as the working fluid. This is how uh, a steam engine usually works. I don't want to go 
into too much details in that one because it'll take a lot of time. Um, this actually is a picture. I, I like it a lot because it moves and so we can see something that we have the very compressed steam, which would be the red one coming in here. Um, I hope you can see my my mouse yes. also in here. Clear. Yes. And very interesting, as much as the steam expands, the volume expands. And as you could see, every cylinder, every piston gets bigger in diameter to cater for the bigger volume of the steam to get more energy out of it. And this is the typical construction, what we could see here, a triple expansion steam engine. And uh, so why did they choose something different for the propulsion of Kaiser Friedrich? Um, if we think of the different stages where you transfer heat and energy from the steam into mechanical work of the the shaft, and technically spoken, as uh, spoken, the more cylinders you have and the more stages you have, um, the better the transfer from heat to energy is. And this is why Schichau Shipyard they tried to do something crazy to build a quadruple expansion, so basically four stages engine with five cylinders. Two cylinders were um, in diameter, so they together would cater for the low pressure valve. And what was very special also, it was the first ever actually, a quadruple expansion, five cylinders steam engine. And what was very special was their concept of positioning it in the hull. And for that, we go back to the shape of a torpedo boat. This would be the outline of a typical torpedo boat. And a torpedo boat normally has the steam engine more or less in the middle of it, in the middle, because there it is very easy to balance the ship. That's one thing. And the other thing is, if we take a look here, we could have boilers which produce the steam and are fired by coal on both sides. So basically, for the workers to feed the coal into the boilers, it's easier and we have two sides with two, two very uh, with very two different uh, sides with short um, um, pipes to get the steam into the engine, and so this is what they chose for the very fast torpedo boats back in the day. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, but yes. I know the boiler. Yes, you know the I boiler. I guess I know the boiler. You know also the building in the back because yeah, for this sure. is the photo I took in the Museum Harbor of Uvelgene. Hamburg, which is a part of Hamburg here, and it's super nice on display there for everyone to see. So what Schichau Shipyard did, they just took that concept of this engine set up and brought it into a liner, which never, never happened before. So they had the steam engine, they had in, in front and on the aft side to that, boiler rooms, and even to the front side, the, um, they had two boiler rooms. So they were basically with three boiler rooms in total, with the engine in the middle, which technically helps a lot in producing a lot of coal, a lot of steam into uh, that, that engine. So th the, the possibility to having a fast running ship is good, but there are also drawbacks, and these drawbacks are um, not to be taken lightly. One thing is the calculated speed, as Dimitri already stated, would be 22.5 plus something knots, and this ship never reached it. One of the problem was, as you could see in this picture, the long shaft. The long shaft, which is needed if you position the steam engine more or less in the middle of the ship to bring it back to the propeller, can have the effect and has the effect that it vibrates. And um, so, in that sense, it wasn't only that the vibration, they, it took away energy, which was supposed to propel the ship through the water. It also made the ship very uncomfortable for everyone traveling on it. So passengers didn't like it because the ship was vibrating harshly. And so that was a big drawback, a big problem for that design. Moreover, because of this complicated setup of the whole technical um, machinery, uh, the circulation pumps did not work satisfactorily. So basically, they couldn't pump enough water around for the amount of steam which was generated by this amount of boiler rooms. Um, so basically, they had to stop even on the travels to America um, 
to that stop one engine or the other because of overheating. And this also slowed down the total speed of the ship. Yeah. It was the basically the basically the a short version of the problems of the ship. For us divers, it's very, very nice though, because this ship really has impressive shafts. Mm -hmm. If you take the time to go down to the bottom at 75 meters and follow the ship from where the shaft leaves the ship's hull and goes outside. It's unbelievable. It's a long, long travel. It, even with a scooter, it takes you five minutes or something to just see everything of it until you reach the propellers, which, as Dimitri state, lost one blade there. So as a short conclusion on the whole thing, it was a technically masterpiece by the concept of it, but unfortunately it didn't work out. It was over-engineered, which, yes, we can still state, is maybe typical German and uh, never lived up to the design <laughs> and expectations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the elaboration, Dirk. Thank you. But, no, I, I, but I think the, 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 the same company repeated this problem with another ship, Dimitri. No. Yes, because this is what I, what I, what I read in the, uh, the, the so-called uh, the cocktail shaker, a different ship that was constructed. Yes, but that was not, that was not, that was not built by, by Friedrich Sika or company. Uh, we, are talking, we are talking about the SS Deutschland of the Habak. Um, of the Habak company. Yes, that was Seiken also. That was very famous. The, um, it was a Seiken. It was the cocktail uh, shaker, yes. <laughs> yes, it, it was a cocktail shaker, but that was made, um, that was built by Vulcan, not by um, uh, not by um, uh, Sikau. That was a but, totally different company. Yes, but, but Dimitri, I have to say, agreeing, but the Vulcan company also was very famous for the torpedo boats. Sure, sure. Because as I mentioned, the Schichau torpedo boats had the S designation and the Vulcan had the V designation. These were Correct. the two very, very well-known torpedo boat constructors in Germany. In, in Greece, we had, we had uh, some um, torpedo boats so in uh, the first and in the second uh, and third, in the, in the first and second Balkan Wars and also in the First World War, uh, built by Vulcan and also by Schichau. Mm -hmm. We had them in Greece. On the comments, I just see a question from Spiros. Are you guys saying that placing the engines in the middle might have something to do with breaking up? Um, interestingly enough, I wouldn't go that far, but interestingly enough, the break in the hull of Budigala is straight in front of the engines, right? Correct. So yeah. you can see, if you, if you dive, we all did that, if you dive through the crack, you could see the the whole of the beauty of the steam engines. It's a fantastic view. It's an unbelievable view. Correct. I would like to mention one more thing. Um, I said before that um, responsible for the sinking of, uh, of um, the SS Budigala was uh, the German Imperial uh, Submarine U-73. Um, and um, uh, I, men I also mentioned the um, the um, uh, um, Captain Lieutenant Gustav Sis. Gustav Sis. Uh, I have to admit that uh, uh, we were lucky enough, Dirk and myself, uh, to dive uh, three ships, we which they've been um, sunk uh, by two famous. U-boats, uh, Imperial German Imperial uh, submarines uh, in the First World War. Well, the first two um, um, HMS um, uh, Britannic and the second Brutigala, and the third <coughs> one um, is the Cartaz uh, in uh, just of the Dardanelles, uh, sunk by U-21 with uh, um, under, um, the commander of the sub was uh, a Captain Lieutenant Otto Herzing. Uh, was it yeah. Hersing's Corner? <laughs> Hersing's Corner. Uh, both of them very famous uh, um, and uh, aces uh, in First World War One. And something for the um, for the Greek audience, which they don't know that we have uh, the bell of U seventy three and the bell of U twenty one exposed uh, in the Ekaterini Laskaridi Foundation in Piraeus, in Pasalimani. Actually, if you get... I didn't know that, Dimitri. When are you bringing me there? 
the next time you're in Greece, I'm going to bring you there. Because I also want to elaborate on this story a, a little bit, and then I'll leave it back to you guys. Because um, U-73, after a World War I, was scuttled outside Pula, Istria. And the position is known, it's diveable. And um, I dove it. It's, it's very broken up. It's, uh, it's visible. It's, it's, you can understand it's a submarine. But still, I mean, to touch this metal, which brought indirectly brought down Budigala and also Britannic, there was something meaningful to me, at least. Sure. Uh, sure. Dimitri, are there still left any reservations whether the Budigala was hit a, hit a mine or was torpedoed? Because there's, there, there's been, or there was, a big, let's say, um, discussion about that, at least at, the, uh, at that time. As you correctly said, uh, there was a discussion, there was an issue about that. But everything is clear right now. Everybody knows that uh, this is, um, uh, that happened due to a minefield uh, late by U-73. Because... Everybody, because... everybody adapted that and uh, uh, this is documented uh, from the uh, um, war, the German war diaries. And also, uh, this is what the, um, the French historians say, that that has been due to a mine, to a mine, to a mine. Um... Despite what has been recorded uh, by, the, by, the, by the captain uh, of Burtigala, that he might have seen uh, a periscope and all that stuff. But in any, in, in, in any, in any sunken... Um, issue, um, there are always somebody, um, a sailor or a captain or engineer or whatever, which they also saw a torpedo, you know, moving against the, uh, the vessel. And uh, also the, um, the newspapers help to spread this, uh, this opinion. But this, it was... is very clear, this, is very clear, this is a very clear thing concerning Burdigala and the Britannic. This is a minefield, yes. This is a minefield issue. Um, okay, there has, uh, Nicola, one more thing. There yes, has so. been there has been no claims from any submarines about the sinking of those two boats. It, it's no. very is is hundred percent clear, right? Yes, completely. According according to the to the research, this is what uh, we ha we have. Uh, it is concluded actually. At um, I would like to talk about a bit. Um, uh, about the chronological, let's say, expedition, chronologically, about the expeditions that have been made uh, on Burdigala over the past 12 years, starting from 2008, briefly, I would say, uh, and what the team um, uh, had brought up during, uh, during on uh, these expeditions. So the first one was organized and has was execute, uh, executed in uh, 2008, Dimitri. It was the year that the, the Burdi Gala was identified, right? Correct. Well, the first, the first expedition, um, as I said before, um, it was just to, um, to document the... Uh, this yes. is a great service. Time for another cold view. <laughs> <laughs> I, next, thank you very much. <laughs> next time we move the we move the the presentation elsewhere. So we, we, we cheers we'll everyone. <laughs> this is the famous Flensburger Pilsner. Fantastic beer. Cheers. Uh, well, the first uh, the first expedition was um, actually we wanted to identify. George, bring your beer. Yeah, that's all, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first expedition was um, to document the, um, the, the wreck, uh, and uh, we were fortunate enough uh, to also identify it. Uh, with, uh, that was a success. Yeah. It's, not very, it's not very easy to identify a wreck. So, so we, 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 uh, we were very successful, and we identified it as uh, Budikala. And um, the, uh, the second expedition was planned for 2009, 
that happened in um, that happened during September and October, end of September, beginning of October two thousand eight. Mm -hmm. And um, so a year later, you went back. We went back. Well, that was at that time that was very complicated to um, uh, to applicate um, uh, a permit for um, for the wreck. We had uh, we needed a, in in uh, I mean it was a very strange and very long procedure application and after getting a permit which took almost half a year or three quarter of a year to um, to get so far. But you finally, you finally, we got it. Got, we got, got it. The permit, right? We got the permit. So we went to the island to dive in 2009. That was September to dive the Bodigala. And uh, we, uh, at the day when we arrived on the island, we had uh, um, uh, the the death of Carl Spencer. I was the the year with the uh, with the fatal with the Carl Spencer Carl, Carl, yes. Carl Spencer issue. Yeah. So so I'm everything was broken. We couldn't dive it. I'm assuming you get not. Yeah, you didn't do anything in that. But uh, but uh, we used the opportunity uh, to dive to dive an aircraft uh, which was uh, uh, located not far away from the uh, away from the Portugala, That was 300 meters, 350 meters away from Portugala. and uh, we dove the um, the uh, the aircraft, the airplane, which we identified it as Junger's U-52 of the um, of the German Luftwaffe. That happened in 2009. And just to make, uh, to tell our friends that is, are watching right now, is uh, that this airplane was uh, spotted during the 2008 expedition because of the sky sensor was uh, being used at that time, right? Correct. So you had the chance to go back instead of doing the booty gala. Um, yes, booty, we uh, have we have an alternative um, a project. I mean, we had to, uh, project A and project B in the case that we were not able to dive project uh, A. So we had the possibility to dive project uh, to to um, uh, to do project B, which we did, and we um, we dove the uh, the aircraft, a fantastic aircraft, and uh, that was the first dive there. So moving, moving moving forward, the, the the next one was in 2010 or 2012. 2010, 2010, you, where, you, where I met I, where I met George Van Voros. But uh, George may talk about that right now. I think George. Yes, uh, I would address. Be much better if you if you if we will hear your uh, your opinion about the the um, the expedition of uh, 2010. George. Well, uh, I will. Uh, just be before that, I would like to. I would like to say. Actually, I would like to state, according to my opinion, that the expeditions that started from 2008, and probably a little bit earlier in the Milos project, 2007, was uh, also a mark about the the, the Greek uh, exploration story. Um, Yes, of course, before that, there were many people that they were exploring wrecks all over Greece and they have um, uh, discovered uh, a lot of interesting uh, stuff and they uh, helped to create the history that we now know and we share and we dive. It's just that, in my opinion, and it's, it's completely my opinion, that from 2007, 2008 and later on, expeditions in Greece started to, to have a form. It was not just two or three friends taking a boat, usually a rib, doing a, a long trip, dive it once and then come back. Uh, somehow during that years, it, 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 the, the, the expeditions took, took the form of weeks or even 10 days with a lot of briefings, with a lot of historical research, where all the divers were on the islands or any other places around Greece, and they were doing that for that specific um, for that specific period of time, and uh, also all the information that was gathered from all those expeditions, they were out to the public. Websites were created. There were daily uh, broadcasts about the results. Right. So. It created, uh, it changed a little bit 
the way that we were dealing with expeditions and exploration from the past to what we do now, which is very, very, very similar. I totally agree, George, because we, we moved from the individualism, like a couple of individuals went and, uh, and did a dive on a wreck from a more organized uh, project that involved many repetitive days of diving, many and different uh, uh, people, divers, support divers, uh, surface support people, people that were doing, uh, were dealing with different administrational or organizational stuff. So, yes, I would, I would agree to this, uh, to this that uh, it was the era starting with Milos Dive Project in 2007. We moved forward to more organized logistically and uh, team-wise projects, let's say. So uh, what it was the, my question now to you, George, in, uh, in your uh, project in 2000, that was 10, right? On the Burdigala, it was 2010, yes. yes. What was the, because there already been two expeditions there, what was the, the one. one of, one, one. Yeah. On Burdigala, yes. Yeah, 2009 one. was on, on, on yeah, the aircraft. Was, somehow it was cancelled, yes. Um, what was the scope of this project there? What was the particular scope of this project, besides diving the wreck that a that couple of guys within the team haven't dived it before? Was it, were you guys focusing on something particularly to, to bring up? Well, w one of the things that we did is that we, we tried to spend more time at depth. Um, we, we did larger dives than 2008. And we, one of the things we searched, and I think it was that time that we found, it was the, the bell, which we tried and we managed to find in the foremast, the bell of the Burdigalarek. And we also um, remeasured the, the lengths and the beams and, the, the, and all the information, uh, making sure that there is no doubt that this is the former Friedrich Kaiser now known as Burdigala. So we spent it lost some, uh, some, some 10 days over in the islands um, with great hospitality from the, from the locals and uh, great help from the, at that time, authorities. They, they provided us a place where we could use as a filling station and we were focused. Uh, and, and we also had some, um, some assistance from uh, great companies like the, the Paramina compressor companies that they offered us compressors that we used and uh, also some um, gas companies that they gave us oxygen and helium to to use for the dive and um, yeah we, we were focused on on making sure uh, double check and confirm finally and for all that this is the wreck of the Burdigala make some video take some extra pictures and uh, can you? Can, can uh, I would like. Sorry, before before asking again, I would like to ask something to what 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 George said. Uh, except that uh, we we've been exa uh, we examined some parts of the vessel which they lie at the at the bottom. Uh, for example, at the starboard side, uh, we we uh, we documented the two funerals of the of the vessel. And on the funerals, if you look carefully, you will still see some parts of the of the of the roosters. We yeah. So of, we, of the funerals of the that happened that happened in 2010. Yeah, and which um, which I also I was thinking about it before when when Dimitris was doing his part of the presentation, that in the side scan sonar image, you can see at the end of the foremast something flat down to the bottom. Right. And this is the funnel. This is uh, what is now left from from the funnel. One of the three funnels. Yes, yeah, so this the is the first. Color. Give us. There, there's a second one also there. Yeah. Almost hanging. Uh, George, just a, yeah. just a, a very last question before I move uh, forward with. Uh, uh, 2012. With a, with a, with a, uh, yeah with the future expeditions. What would be the picture, uh, or what was the picture you have? taken back then from just 
just the incident you've taken away from this uh, this expedition back then. If you can recollect, if it was something special that you left with when you, when the fi the project finished. You you have something very specific in your brain. I know that. I can see that in your eyes. I just I no, can I can drive I, it out of saying, my head. It's all right then. So, Mr. Derek Remmers. Sir. Uh, we're moving forward, and we are privileged to have you diving the Budigala in 2012. 12. <laughs> with this other two individuals here, with uh, dear George, who I got to, uh, got to know there, and with Dimitris, which, um, who I, I knew before already. So what exactly? What? How was the the that you felt diving the first time, the first dive, let's say, on the first dive on Butigala, and what was the any particular um, scope you had for that dive? Just going see the wreck first, I guess. Well, the the idea was, I mean, I <laughs> for this very first expedition I did to the. Bodhigala, I have a lot of memories and very, very good memories for that matter. Um, very first idea was we can't get to the wreck. If you remember correctly, it was George and Yanis placing the shot line and in the ripping current, you were the guys with the big scooters there, yeah. remember? And you went down and put the line down and Willem and me, we were team number two, if I remember correctly. Yes. And we found the line drifted away from the wreck. So we decided, and we were open circuit, we decided at uh, 75 meters, and it was drifted against a box, which at first looked like the bottom part of a mine, which it wasn't, unfortunately. It would have been super interesting to, to find that part. It was kind of like, I don't know, 30 to 50 meters away from the wreck. So we decided, maybe we could call it stupid, but <laughs> we decided to take that line at that anchor and bring it over to the wreck. And uh, so we spent like half of our bottom time and just carrying this 20 kilos of weight down at 75 meters and dragging it with our scooters um, towards the wreck and then fix it on the polar there on the wreck. And um, so due to the fantastic work of George there, we had the opportunity to see the wreck. And my, my first thought was when we came down there and I saw this, this huge, 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 huge hull coming up from 75 meters. I was like, oh my God, this yeah. is something. Like, this is something. Unbelievable sight. And then we, we approached it, we went up, and we turned to the deck, and it was like, wow, this is even more fantastic. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I remember also, I think there was dive number two or three, George, you remember? When I was filming the bow, and you and Yanis, you were scootering by, and yeah. it's just you think of this 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 take with a camera of someone scootering by a bow of like normally you think okay that's a minute of a take, it was five minutes or more which we spent there with these guys arriving, crossing the bow, turning around, going back there. It's such a huge thing. It's just still, it doesn't cease to amaze me, this wreck. Yes. Okay, okay, Derek, I'm sold. Can we have any footage that we can, uh, we can, we can see what you've been describing? We can as, at least try. As, as Derek is getting ready for the footage, I just need to, to say that, that in, in that expedition, it was actually the hardest current that I have ever faced uh, in the Burdigala until, until recently. Um, it was difficult to maneuver even with the scooters. In, yes. in the previous years, in 2010, we could dive even without a scooter on the wreck with not much of a problem. Okay, scooter would make our life easier, but we, we could work our way. But in 2010, I do remember I was, I was on the bow, and I was, sorry, I was on the stern, and I was trying to keep myself with a scooter um, to, to cross from one side to the other side on, on the stern, and I just couldn't. I need, I had, I had my scooter on a full throttle last year, and I had to swim in order to move forward. 
the scooter was just balancing the current. Everybody who was um, uh, who had an experience of the of the current in the uh, in the in the Kia Strait uh, knows exactly what um, George uh, is talking about. But unlike 2012, in 2016, which we talk about in a bit, there wasn't uh, there wasn't that kind of current. No. Actually, no. If I can rip. Uh, there uh, was a current. There was a current, but yeah, not but, so deep. But not in uh, uh, not of that speed. Uh, Derek, is your uh, uh, video ready to be presented? I hope so. Let me try and see it, man. whether it, it works. Does does it work? Do you see my screen? Yes, yes. we do. Yes. yes. Then we, we start a video. This should be. This is 2016, correct? Exactly. And uh, so here, now we are laying down a memorial plate. This is actually Nikos and Dimitris laying down a memorial correct. plate about the sinking of Bodhigala. And, the 100 uh, years uh, yes, from memory. Event. Yes. And here we have, we see one of the guns. As we all know, the the Bodhigala was a warship, so they fitted guns to that construction. Here we see what the George bell. was talking about, the bell. This is the bell on the foremast, and this is the seven windows of the bridge of Bodhigala. I, was, I, will, never, I will never stop loving this sight. It's, to me, yeah. it's just it's so beautiful. fantastic. When you come up there, you see the shoals of fishes around there, and you come up there, and now you enter the area which used to be the bridge, the wheelhouse, and when you take a look down here, you see all the mechanics from the steering wheel, from everything transmitting the, the, the ideas from the... Sh yeah, there you see, there you see, this, 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 is, the, this is actually the middle, the, the shaft of the steering wheel. And now we see inside this... Uh, look at this, the yeah, engine the telegraphs. telegraphs. Yeah. It's just, uh, this is, I, I'm sitting here, it makes me shivers and smile at the same moment. Look at this. It's, isn't it beautiful? I mean, how could, how could marine life even enhance the beauty of this telemotors? Here we have this speaking device down to the engine rooms. And it, it just you turn around, wherever you turn, you see some, something really special. Uh, it doesn't matter where you look at. Something's beautiful. Something's very special on this ship. A museum, a, a, a literally an underwater museum. It is exactly as my my dear friend Mario Arena put it that the ocean is the biggest museum of the world. And here we have one of the parts of this museum which just exhibits so much, so much to everyone who wants to look at. And uh, it's just uh, look at this. Here you see even down there you see where um, it's it's on full back. The, the demo here, we see this is the, uh, the the deck on the front where we approach the front where there was an anti-aircraft gun uh, situated, which is mm -hmm. there we see uh, th this is a little uh, a crane, I think, uh, yes, but in front of that, crane. it's a crane for the anchors, for the auxiliary anchor. And now we see um, our friend De uh, Maurizio decompressing in silence on top of the wreck, being very happy and very content after this dive. And uh, yeah, there you see, I this was where. this was one of the days where the current was really low, so we could really enjoy the whole thing and uh, the wreck in total. I think it was the it was it was the dive, uh, Dimitri, that we were uh, buddy up uh, and we had uh, uh, at the deco stop with uh, the guy from Britain. Remind me of his name. You're, you're lead, you're your dear friend Lee. Lee Bishop. Yes, yes, <laughs> Lee. our good Bishop. friend, our, our, brief, our good friend um, Lee Bishop. Lee yeah. Bishop, actually. Yeah, we were, that was that. We were digging with that Lee Bishop. That was a day. That was a day. Correct. Yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, so with this video, we moved to uh, 2016, yeah. and uh, with a purpose, let's say, uh, given the commemorative event of 100 years of care regs to place this. Um, this uh, plug on on uh, Butigala and on on the Britannic, uh, and uh, by the way, Derek, it was the it was the year that uh, since you had this um, 
problem with the line with George and, and Yanis, you employed Galon to throw the line properly, right? <laughs> <laughs> so if you say, if you say, why do you laugh? I don't understand you guys. If you say okay. Galon is going to drop the line, that means uh, it's going to be exactly. No, I'm it's just, going to I'm be exact saying, on the I'm point. I'm saying so, that this, this poor guy had a problem with the line uh, like uh, four years before. And in 2016, he employed you and your expertise to throw the line so you go directly on the wreck. Don't Correct. get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. I'm not complaining about anything George did with the line because he did well. I'm just saying that Dimitri and me, we have a story about his line work and his way of putting shotting racks. And it, it's not only in Greek waters. It even happens in Turkish waters or whatever. And there's even TV recordings of us working with the line together really well and not hitting the rack. <laughs> <laughs> That can happen too, actually. Yeah. And uh, any particular uh, that you guys discovered in... Uh, no, we didn't discover anything in 2016. And then we moved... Uh, it was uh, just one last, dive. Yeah, it was just one dive, exactly. So, and then we moved last year, September 2019, with a brilliant team. If you guys are there... Uh, you're a very good, very, very For sure. uh, good I'm sure, team. I'm sure that some of those guys like uh, uh, Ralph Wiesel or Henning May or Marcus Kerbat, um, Stefan Klimas, um, Chris, and Chris, our dear friend Chris, yes. Chris, great, fantastic, great team. incredible yeah. team that was, that was a JJ CCR team. Yeah. Um, all of the members were diving JJ CCR. Um, and it was a year Peter. actually for for a huge current on the wreck. It was yes. a year. Well, not huge, but there was current on the wreck. Yes. Uh, the first two days, it was reported that uh, the the current on the wreck was was tremendous. But not not like 2012. Really? Yeah. No, it was it was current and it was it was disturbing current. Let's say disturbing for dive operation. Oh. You're talking 2019. No, sorry, I'm. 2019. I'm out. I'm out of that. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. It's okay, man. Um, uh, Vasilis uh, uh, uh has a question. Do we know if there were any uh, casualties on the wreck? We know that there was one guy, right? Yes, but he didn't die on the wreck. He died in the hospital in Piraeus. Because he was out of. Uh, he was injured um, due to the steam. Yeah, yeah, because he was he was in the on the in the engine room and exactly. the pipe blew, blew. so steam. he yeah a steam pipe he was blew. burned he was burned somehow all over his uh, his body, and he has to be carried to the hospital in Piraeus where he where he died. So we, are no, we, are we have no... to mention the name about the team. It was oh. Andre Wagner. Wagner. Andre Wagner also yes was yes great team great team member also. Yes. Um, do we um, in a, do we have any uh, any other uh, underwater photos, Dimitri? We we missed no. Uh, I do have some if you want. This is great. Uh, I and, and only that, see that's one that's one more thing that we have to say and add about our our friend Dirk. That there have been many people that they have taken pictures uh, of Burdigala, but for some reason, uh, Dirk's pictures were everywhere. Yeah. Dirk's pictures made Burdigala um, an image world, to world many famous. divers around the world. Is world it like famous. That? Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, that, that's a fact. Don't thank me. I mean, uh, thank everybody else that liked the pictures. <laughs> at the beginning of this presentation, not only I mentioned that not only we, we brought uh, you guys here uh, just because you, you've been to some of these expeditions, but only is a way to acknowledge um, your assistance, your contribution uh, on this wreck. Of course, uh, Derek's pictures uh, are incredible. Uh, went all over the the internet. We share many of them, uh, and we have to acknowledge that uh, because these pictures come out of uh, 
you know, expertise, lots Very of work in the past. Stop it, it's too to, much, it's too much, yeah. To that, okay. <laughs> uh, so, um, I'm trying to share the screen right now. I don't know if it works. You did. Yes, it works. Here we, is, see, we, we see we see Mauricio just in front of the um, of the bell of Portugalá. And this is a picture I love very much because this here. This is beautiful. Um, it, a man is beautiful. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm not talking uh, to me. It's not the picture. It's just what I see there. It's so rare to see the bell of a ship in place where it belongs and see the steer, steering house in between with a knock and the fishes around there. It's a beauty. It's just a beauty to me. Yeah. All right. we, Dimitri, there's a comment. Spiros asked, how long did, the, did it take to, for the ship to sink? Uh, 45 minutes. 45? Yes. And yes, it broke see, when it hit the bottom. Very, very sure of that. Okay, uh, the ship. Uh, okay, uh, because he also asked, do we know if the ship broke in two when the surface, or do we think that when it went and hit the bottom? So when it hit the there bottom, was, there was a second explosion on the surface. Yeah, but the the hull is complete. I mean, we have to we have to think of a ship which is almost 190 meters long, correct, and waters which are 75 meters deep. So yes. that means when one part of the ship which sinks first. I think here also the bow it was sinking first. No, um, it, hits, was, it was the aft, the aft. It was the stern sinking first, hitting the bottom, and then only the, the ship goes down there. And then you have to imagine that the hull has to take the whole load of the flooded water and all the steel in the middle, so it, it's very likely to crack. And this is what happened here. Um, unfortunately, I think I do not have a picture. You have to, I, I do have, but preparation time for this picture were quite quite uh, short what? So, so what what we're seeing here this is the, these are the cylinders of the um of the port side engine Ex mm -hmm. actually and as Dimitri describes here this is the quadruple expansion five cylinder um, steam engine and what we can see here on on top these two are the two cylinders of the fourth stage so basically the biggest ones. And here we see this is a pathway where the engineers could walk over to check mm -hmm. for the cylinders there. And this is in the open now. If you hoover on top of the rack, on top of the, the superstructure, you could take a look inside. It's fantastic. It's really fantastic. It gives it away. Oh, same picture again. Why is there not more? What is this? Ah. There. This is uh, our dear friend, Mr. Nikos Vardakas, carrying the commemorial plate to the place where it was, was placed. And mm -hmm. my dear friend, Nikos, he has the, uh, the, his, his habit is to bring a scooter to the dive, and whenever I take the camera, to not use it. <laughs> I, I have some pictures of him of bringing a scooter to a dive and not using it <laughs> while whilst I'm taking a photo. Yeah, um, this is the wrong plate, by the way. This is the Britannic and yes. honor the Carl yeah. Spencer plate, even. Uh, in, a, in a future presentation after the, uh, uh, November. Yes, exactly. So I have to stop here because this is what I um, chose um, in this very speedy, speedy, idea of using uh, this presentation? Uh, so, Dimitri, I think with uh, this is a, this is a wrap up for, for this presentation. Um, is there anything left on your side? Not really, but please keep in mind uh, that the, um, the, um, the wreck of the SS Porticala is one of the most important wrecks of the Greek seas. The second largest um, wreck uh, discovered in the Greek seas. Uh, the, um, the history of, um, of, of the vessel is even more important than, uh, not, not important, but, uh, but longer and uh, more interesting, I would say, it's comparing, compared. comparing to the Britannic, because Britannic was, was built and after it was built, and after that, it became a hospital ship for a couple of years, 
uh, till the end in um, in November uh, 2016, uh, yeah. 19, uh, 19, 1916. Okay. That's and, why uh, I would encourage I would encourage uh, uh, our friends to go and check. Uh, there's a link that I have posted earlier, so they can check the whole the whole story there um, um, uh, of the of the early stage of the, the construction until her sinking with yes. lots of details. Uh, the the article, the huge article is just written in so they can have the chance to go through a lot of details. Um, I think uh, talking, I think to, talking talking about those two we just, 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 just reached the third, third year, year, so it's so time it's time, time, time to to call the station. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, George, George, what you what were you saying? saying? Yes, what I was saying is, to, talking about those two wrecks, uh, the Britannic and the Burdigala, I have to say that in my head, Britannic is the man and Burdigala is the lady. Burdigala is beautiful, is very beautiful. You can spend a lot of days, a lot of hours uh, spending on that wreck and still having things to see that you haven't seen or noticed in previous dives. It's, it's, it's a joyful time spending, well worth the decompression that you need to do, which is not huge because of that ideal depth that the wreck is standing and is, is a jewel, is a jewel. The, the, it's, it's only the last two, three years that people from all over the world are starting actually to recognize the beauty of the Burdigala and they start asking for it. Before yes. that, it was only Britannic, which is, yeah, it's a beautiful wreck. I mean, I, 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 I have things to say about that at another time, but the beauty that you will see on that lady Burdigala and the bottom of the Kea channel is unique. I think this is the uh, best way of putting it. It's unbelievable, George, that yes, it's the lady. And this is, I think, perfect final words, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, dear friends who are watching us now, thank you for staying with us uh, for this. Uh, we are now two hours uh, live. Um, as I said before, the, this is our last presentation of this season. We will be back in November. For sure, we're going to be uh, doing uh, presentations uh, in English uh, selectively uh, for some regs because we also will be running this presentation uh, in Greek. Uh, thank you for watching us, uh, dear friends and guests. Thank you for being tonight here. Derek Remes, George Van Dorno, Dimitri Gallon. Uh, it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure to be here. Faristo. <laughs> <laughs> Miko, before we close, I, I, I need to say that for you, to you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, in those presentations. Um, and thank you for organizing all this during the times we spend it because of the virus at our home. But also that you continue that until today and you're pushing it for the season number two. It is very important, it is very educational, it is very well done, and uh, from my side, and I know other people that there are students and friends and co-divers, they enjoy those, those, these, these Saturdays, and we thank you very much for that. We do, on Vardax and on Scuba Life, on this presentation. And Thank also Josh Van Voros. Van Voros. Cheers, everybody. Yes. Thank you, guys. And Galon for being there and Derek for being where just, you are. And just very last word on my side. It's, uh, I, th I found this presentation not because, uh, uh, you know, it is me being involved, but I found this presentation that we all learn of uh, uh, maritime history in the, in the Mediterranean in Greece uh, uh, because uh, it was a it was a um, um, uh, drive for me to go and read a lot of stuff, and I realized, I, I, as I told Dimitri earlier, uh, offline, off uh, off air, uh, that um, 
that so many pieces you find along the way that fill up the, this puzzle of maritime history globally, and particularly in the in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, in the in the Mediterranean. Thank you, guys. I'm I'm privileged for all this. Uh, and Dimitri, thank you very much. We we start this together. Uh, we'll continue my that. Pleasure. My pleasure. I thank uh, you very much, more, guys. More to come. Thank you, everyone. Uh, see you through this uh, through this uh, broadcast in November. It's, it's fantastic to, to have to have such such good team. It's incredible. Thank so, you very much for inviting me also, and also thank you very much for keeping this in English so I can follow you. <laughs> exactly. So stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, it's, uh, it's, I think it's going to be in the very, very near future we're going to be diving again all together. Thank you, guys. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Have a good night. Bye-bye.